and welcome to About Books. Tonight we'll be visiting Literally Bookshop in New Brighton, an independent bookshop owned by Cathy and Pete, based in the Wirral seaside town. Later in the show we'll be talking to Ian Jackson about his new novel, Deadly Determination. But first, Literally. Opened in 2012, Cathy and Pete wanted to create not only a bookshop to celebrate the written word, they also wanted to create a hub, one that celebrates creativity in all its glory. They collect new books, old books, even collectible and rare books. Tim Quinn dropped in to find out more. Welcome to About Books. This week, we're overseas. Well, we're in New Brighton, literally. The reason we're here? to have a chat with the owners of the world's greatest bookshop. That's what I think. Follow me. Pisa and Kathy. Hello. Thank you for welcoming us into your amazing shop. I feel very much at home. Good. Here we are, literally, yes. in literally, mm -hmm. the world's greatest bookshop. I'd tomorrow. say so, wouldn't yes, you please? I've ever. heard people yeah, saying that. Yeah, ever. Yeah. 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 Um, can you tell us the origins of literally? How did this come about? When? Well, we both love books. Mm -hmm. We both have between us quite a few thousand books. Peter's been a book editor for a number of years. And I've been a reader. I'm a storyteller by profession. And we had friends who had this shop, who were looking to leave, they were moving back to Manchester. They'd started a bookshop, but it was mainly a paperback modern bookshop. And every time I came in, I used to imagine the books that we might have in here if we ever had a bookshop like this. And when they said they were moving, we thought, well, why not? So we thought we'd try. And it was one of those things that when we said what we were doing, people would say, we'd say we're opening a bookshop, and they'd go, what? Literally a bookshop. So we thought, that's a good name. And it went from there. We uh, we thought we'd just give it a go, see how it went, and we're still here. Your work through your lives has been with words. So was this a dream? I mean, did you have this in mind from uh, uh, your youth that one day I will run a bookshop? I've always loved bookshops like like Kathy and I think a lot of people you speak to, uh, I spoke to Bill Kenwright and he said, what are you up to next? I've got a bookshop. He said, that's my dream. That's Bill Kenwright. Mm -hmm. When you see like the films and there's certain films set in bookshops like um, Notting Hill. 84 uh, Charing Cross 84 Road. Charing Cross Road, yeah. But I mean, Notting Hill where the, the guy runs, uh, Hugh Grant runs a travel bookshop. I mean, that's fantasy. <laughs> When you're dealing with a real bookshop, it's a lot different. It's hard. It's mm. not easy. But like you say, Tim, working with words, when I ceased, well, I don't cease to be a journalist. I was a journalist. I still am. Uh, and when I was made redundant due to the economic downturn, <laughs> which is something I'll find on one of those shelves one day to see what it means, uh, we thought, where next? And when Cathy said, it, it, like it fell into place, yeah. that here's a bookshop, New Brighton, where I used to come as a kid, and I believe since we've been here that I used to get my bucket and spade here yeah. from, with my dad. So to sit in a bookshop and have the choice to dream, it's like being in a record shop, pick the CDs off and all the rest of it. Every person who comes in here has a story, just like all, all the books on the shelves. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have some great moments, you have some difficult customers, you have some beautiful customers. Uh, you know, my, my favourite memory in our, is we're in our third year now. Um, it seemed like the natural progression to mm. go into a bookshop. When one woman came in and said, have you got Lionel Richie in the wardrobe? I knew <laughs> this was a vocation <laughs> that we had to keep going. And we've got some lovely patrons who supported us. Ken Dodd opened the shop. Mm -hmm. Bill Kenwright's a patron. Willie Russell. Yeah. So well, I saw Mike McCartney giving a talk Mike in that Mc very right. chair yes. a while back. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're very ambitious about doing things that we can get into the community. And our next plan is the Literally Literary Festival, where we have 
many famous people, including one guy who used to work on Marvel Comics. Mm. He's going to come here. That sounds Apparently. good. Yeah, it yeah. sounds good. I'll yeah. let him out. It's hard, yeah, hard. He drinks loads of tea. So. Um, when is this coming up? I should this, certainly put it in my diary. <laughs> <laughs> this is May or June, but okay. it's something we've always wanted to do. Yeah. We've had guest speakers from Willie Russell, Ricky Tomlinson, Mike McCartney, as you say, people, authors who will help people get their books published. So it's very much an all-round, all-enveloping bookshop. Because the thing is, Tim, you, you can't just be a bookshop anymore. You, no. you can't be static. Absolutely. You've got to go out into the community. Kathy goes out and story tells. And we've got a book fair. We do book fairs once we've, a month. We've had bookshop theatre. Bookshop theatre. Because theater. if you look at the layout of the shop, we've got the curtains. That's why we've oh, got yeah. them. Because we turn the back of the shop into a stage. We clear out some of the furniture that we have. We put seats out and we've had very successful, um, a murder mystery company called Sudden Death Theatre did um, their own rendition of an Agatha Christie and it was um, a new work and it, it worked very, very well. Just three actors and it, it went down a storm. So we, we want to do more bookshop theatre. We also have, this, this is very much a maritime community. Obviously you walk outside, there's the sea. And we're very lucky to be by the sea. Um, a lot of the old mariners have come in. We've had one of the ex-river pilots had his book here. He brought out his book. He did a talk. We've had a um, very pro prolific merchant uh, navy captain who's um, pretty much an authority um, on training for merchant navy people. Um, he's brought his books here, Michael Lloyd. We've had a number of different people, so it's not just artistic people that come here, it's all sorts of different people. Children, I imagine they find this a wonderland. Um, what is your take on kids and bookshops today? Because we do hear that children aren't reading. No, it's... Are they? It, yeah, I think they are. I think the trouble is that possibly it's adults that think that they're not. But when we had the boys in here, they were sitting on cushions on the floor and they were looking at some of the older books and because I think Harry Potter has helped us because the images, particularly in the film, of the the shop where they go to get their books um, on magic, when you actually see all these old books piled up, children still love them. And they made a beeline for the old encyclopedias. A couple of the boys didn't know what an encyclopedia was, you know. And when you said, well, it's the equivalent of Wikipedia, they knew what that was. But suddenly there's these books that they can open and they can see pictures. and I don't think children will ever lose, certainly they won't lose imagination. And I think that obviously there's all sorts of reasons why a child can't read or can struggle with reading. And you can, you can deal with that. It's having the time to spend. You have to think that children are well worth it. So children need sometimes to have that little bit of extra encouragement to read. It's never going to be a problem, I don't think, but I, I think long term. I do think there's an issue with conversation because social media moves so fast and communication is abbreviated for the social media. So there is an issue now with um, older children who just don't want to talk for very long and possibly are frightened of stringing a sentence together because they don't need to until maybe they go for a job. And um, we've been approached by... Um, couple of different community agencies if we can help with that um, but books have got I think still a very long lifespan I think the more you take away from people and you try to make people machines or an extension of a machine the more people will rebel other favorite authors that um, pull children in today yeah I'd say Roald Dahl Roald Dahl I think yes. he's number yeah. one I think he's number one uh, and also um, Jacqueline Wilson Right. Yes, yeah. For the girls. You know, she she is very very Tracy Beaker. Yeah. Uh, David Walliams, who has gone from Little Britain into becoming one of the most successful authors, you know he he has come up with things that kids can relate to or children never call them kids, yeah. mm -hmm. children can relate to. They're hitting the nerve there, and they get t made into television programs. Yeah. Um, and as you you know yourself, um, Tim uh, Jack and Ori, I think, if you mention that to, to children now they go what was that yeah. 
when you have a revamped one like the great one on Bay TV, mm. of which you know we need programs like that. We need to go back to go to the future, mm -hmm. if you like. And, and I think you know, like Kathy was saying, if you bring a kid up on a school kid on um, mobile phones, iPads, they're missing that magic, the the magic mm -hmm. of the imagination. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say my own, per, you know, my, my favourite authors, C.S. Lewis, um, Charles Dickens, you know, you will, Charles Dickens is just magnificent. And we've got a whole load behind me here. Dickensian, the TV series, mm, a whole not. new generation are learning about Dickens now. Um, and the volume of Dickens that we've got, the, the red volumes over there, they were produced when he was still alive. Yeah. So that is his publisher, Chapman yeah. Hall. So what, what's the appeal of those books to kids of the 21st century? Because we're talking about books now from the 50s. I think, well, I think it's because parents will come in and say, I grew up on that. Yeah. You yes. know, <laughs> one man. Is, is that not guaranteed to put any child off? Not, I, not, I think, honestly, Tim, if you saw when people pick up a Lady Bird book and in it it's got uh, my first book going back to the 50s or the 60s, there's something beautifully nostalgic about that. Yeah. So some child has learned the future from these books. Yes. Yeah. The parents then pass it on. Yeah. Uh, and I was once asked, you know, what is the appeal of the bookshop? And I just think these books have lived. These, yeah. You know, somebody calls them not secondhand books, but much loved books. Uh -huh. It sounds absolutely fantastic. I've I think you've described the need for this place <laughs> in every town across the UK, across the world. Um, we think so. Um, thank you both for inviting us in today. Very we'll welcome. be back. Thank you. Ian Jackson is a local magazine and sports programme publisher and has run his own business since 1989. Also an accomplished feature writer, Ian has written many articles for consumer magazines such as Concept for Living and The Style Guide for the Daily Mail. His second novel, Deadly Determination, is a fast-paced crime roller coaster thrill ride set in and around Liverpool. He visited us recently to tell us about his career. I'm here with Ian Jackson, who's the author of Deadly Determination, a crime thriller novel which features the police set here in Liverpool. Hi, Ian. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. Would you like to tell us, especially those people who are at home who might not yet have read the book, would you like to tell us a little bit about what it's about? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's probably easier to tell you about the book. Uh, based on the experience of how it came about. Lovely. I'm, um, I have a keen interest in psychology um, and uh, I wanted to um, write about crime and write about criminals and their uh, relationship with their crimes and how they actually come to um, end up um, in the position that they are. Um, I spent some uh, some time working in Arrow Park Hospital in the uh, psychiatric unit. Wow. And also uh, at the Ark in Birkenhead, which is a homeless shelter. Yeah. Um, and I was very interested in the way that people think differently to how you would think that normal people think. I don't mean normal people in that sense. I just mean uh, people perhaps who don't have the, the same kind of... Um, psychological difficulties that uh, that, that uh, some people have, and I, I wanted to then go on to think about how uh, they might then go on to commit crimes and how they might feel. And I hope that one of the themes that comes through in uh, the books that I write is that you can uh, identify with uh, the criminal as well as the people who are trying to, to catch that criminal and trying so to solve that. So it's not just about crime. rejecting so them not, that's or right, seeing yeah, them yeah. as different somehow. No, that's right. but... And I hope that by the end of the book, you might even have some sympathy with, uh, with, uh, with the person who's committed those crimes. What kinds of crimes did you decide to focus on? Tell us that much, but don't tell us who did it. Okay. <laughs> um, Murder, I love murder, murder. I love to Why kill people. Why do you love people. murder? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because I can't murder anybody in real life. So, so it's cathartic. So I like it. <laughs> you, uh, you, you, you create characters. You don't create characters to kill them. You create characters to, uh, to, to love them. 
but uh, that's but then, nice. Do you really? Yeah, that absolutely, sounds yeah. nice. No, but absolutely. No, you do it's create true. them to kill them, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones that I kill, sometimes I do shed a tear. You know. Has there been anybody in this particular book, or or in another book of yours, that you've really found it quite difficult to dispose of? Yeah, I think that um, as the book, I, what I tend to do is create the characters first, and I, I draw out the characters, and I. Uh, you know, their height and their weight and their eye colour and what they look like and how they appear and how they move and and think about the, the character as a whole and then put them into situations which perhaps they're not going to be familiar with or they're going to be uncomfortable with and then find out how the characters deal with that. Right. So sometimes when it comes to killing off a character... you think to yourself, well, actually, you know, there, there's much more that I could do with this character, but you know, they've got to go, and that's <laughs> Is there for ever the plot. A, a point at which you were tempted to kill off your central character, D.I. Karen Bellows, which is... Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. There were a couple of times when I thought she should yeah, go, yeah. you know. <laughs> a couple of times, and she was put in, in situations where uh, perhaps she was in danger. So, so you know, I, I with a couple of sweeps of a pen, I could have... Could have uh, done it. It's very I powerful it. role. Yeah, absolutely, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is powerful. Why did you decide to make your chief character a, a female detective inspector and also a queer female detective yeah, inspector? Yeah, just to give less. some balance to the book. I, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, everybody has a different sexuality. Everybody, you know, uh, 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 there are homosexual detectives. And I think that, uh, that there's nothing wrong with writing uh, from that point of view. I tend to write from my character's point of view as much as I possibly can. Mm. Um, but uh, creating a woman was, in a sense, um, some kind of leverage against some of the violence in the book, because murder is very violent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not suggesting that the, the pages are splattered with blood. They're absolutely not. Some of them are. But, uh, <laughs> but I think that uh, creating a female character can, can just, you know, try and hedge that that violence off a little bit. You've had to harden her a bit, although her childhood does that too, doesn't it? Because one of the things you focus on is not just the criminal's kind of trajectory or life trajectory, but also the life trajectory of some of your other characters. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting to think about how um, different people can have similar upbringings or be in similar situations and then choose different very paths. different paths. Yeah, yeah and I think that, uh, that that is inter interesting. Have you got any conclusions as to how or why that should be you raise people the same and then criminality is chosen by one and not by another I think there have been many books written by more intelligent people than me on the subject but I think that uh, that obviously your environment yeah. uh, is uh, is a big driver uh, and also the choices you make um, uh, faced with choices early in life you you based on those choices depends on which road you uh, you take you often hear of criminals don't you who've uh, who spent many many years in prison and yet then come out and became um, very good members of society mm. perhaps written books or gone on to you know to uh, to play football or, or whatever you know the, it's not the end of life mm -hmm. uh, making mistakes it's actually just part of the journey I think what is it that your characters can cling to morally? Is there any Christian context or religious context or socialist context or anything like that? Religion's always very difficult to deal with um, in a crime thriller, I think. Uh, unless you're, that's part of your specific theme. Right. Um, and actually, in my next book, there is a religious uh, context. Well, that's and, cool. Tell us a little and, bit about that, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, you know, um, I'm set, my next book set in uh, Bradford. Okay. And uh, within the Muslim community and how they interact with the uh, the the rest of Bradford, if you like. Okay. Uh, but I was born a Roman Catholic, so you know, but but none of that really comes out in the in the book. I don't think. So, what do people cling to? From a moral perspective, yeah, in the book. I, I think that uh, that you know they they refer to their own moral compass. I think and, and each other maybe and each other, yeah, yeah. definitely, so, and, and certainly family. You know, there's a yeah. there's a great sense of uh, redemption within family. I think uh, within the uh, within the text is that a Scouse thing that you were writing? Is it because the context in terms of the geography is is Liverpool and also Southport principally, yeah, it is. isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, you know, I was born in Liverpool. 
um, yay, in, uh, in Elrode in uh, 1964. <laughs> and um, you can guess my age from that. <laughs> Actually, my maths is terrible, <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just think that Liverpool uh, people uh, are very unique people. I think that, you know, as a, as a group, I don't know if it's the geographical nature of the way Liverpool mm. is faced by the Mersey and then, uh, and then by uh, by the sea on the other side. I'm not a geographer, so I don't know the name <laughs> of the sea. Um, but uh, but I think Liverpool's quite cut off and quite isolated, and and uh, even you know the links to Manchester. It's seen as a big journey to go from Liverpool to Manchester. And why you know? would you? No, just kidding. <laughs> For everyone from Manchester, just kidding. Just kidding. Um, you and, think about immigration uh, as well. I think though yeah, too. True, Liverpool's very welcoming. Yeah, it is. I mean, my uh, background, my uh, my grandmother was uh, Lithuanian oh. and uh, came over, obviously, when uh, when Stalin was killing all of the Lithuanians. Mm. She uh, she uh, came over on the uh, on one of the many uh, refugee boats at the time and we ended up in Liverpool. Um, she couldn't speak any English, as, as far as I remember, uh, and died when I was young, but that didn't stop her you know, living her life and creating a family and, and being, being brave. It yeah. must have been a very brave thing to do. Mm. And uh, she was, uh, I think that she was very happy. There's deadly determination about bravery. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it is. I, I think it's about cowardice as well. Tell me about um, that. I think that, uh, that um, the one of the detectives who's, uh, who's featured in the book uh, becomes very, very, very cowardly, mm -hmm. and he comes under pressure from both uh, criminals, his family, um, his colleagues, um, and uh, and he ends up, um, you know, uh, doing some pretty cowardly things. But there are, yeah, but yeah, yeah and corruption is important. You know, uh, I think that uh, I'm not suggesting uh, by any stretch of the imagination that any of the police are. Uh, are corrupt in any way, shape, or form. But I think individuals within the organisation, they have the opportunity. It's true of any large organisation, isn't That's it? Or perhaps it's just true of human nature in yeah, general. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think when uh, presented with opportunities, human beings might make the wrong choice from time to time. But then again, they might make the right choice. And that, that as you suggest, there is a lot of ba bravery. Um, and the book I is ultimately book. redemptive. I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah I think and is that, it quite positive about the justice system? Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. I, I think that uh, the the justice system comes off well, and uh, and I think that uh, Liverpool comes off very well in the book. Uh, I tried to include as many of the places that I love in Liverpool uh, as I could, like Otterspool and uh, and uh, Hope Street and. And I was born at the top of Upper Parliament Street, which is Earl Road, as you yeah, know. Yeah. So that kind of area is uh, very familiar to me. Before we close, have you got one word of advice for people who might be keen on writing crime fiction themselves? You mentioned earlier, you know, uh, there's this idea that you can self-publish, which is very valuable. But I think that the best thing to do is find a literary agent, find a publisher, um, publish in the traditional way, and uh, because then you get lots and lots of support. Well, thanks very much for coming in today, Ian. That's so that's okay. Ian Jackson, Deadly Determination. Thanks very much for watching About Books. We'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.